Welcome to our newly updated 2004 ServiceNow Fundamental Series. Jeff here from ServiceNow Simple, where we help you understand the ins and outs of ServiceNow with a focus on keeping things as simple as possible. In this video, we look at how ServiceNow utilizes the concepts of users, groups, and roles to understand who a user is and what they do. In ServiceNow, we call that their persona, and it's critical in the platform's ability to provide the exact set of tools user needs to get their work done. Some keywords to look for in this video include instance, user administration, user, sys user, group, sys user group, role, sys user role, data model, and relationships. And as always, thanks for being part of the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already. Let's jump into it. We talked in our previous video about how it makes sense to visualize the ServiceNow platform is being made up of three components, a database, suite of business applications, and a development environment. And remember, the platform is cloud-based. You access it via a web browser or a mobile application. But before you as a user can actually log in and access the platform, a couple things need to happen. First, your company needs to get set up with a contract to use ServiceNow, and that means negotiations and payments and paperwork. Stuff that if you're lucky, you won't be involved with as a user, or developer, or administrator of the platform. Once that's all taken care of, what ServiceNow will do is spin up a full stack copy of the platform specifically for your company. That means that your company gets its very own unique version of the database, suite of applications, and development environment. We call that an instance of the platform. One cool thing to note here is that this instance of the platform that they deliver you is entirely dedicated to your company alone. Unlike most cloud delivery models, the database, for example, isn't shared with other customers of ServiceNow. It's solely entirely yours, which gives you more control over things like scheduled downtime for upgrades and new releases. And they call this a single tenant architecture. That would be versus a multi-tenant architecture. So you and your company essentially have no roommates, which is great. But wait, there's more. ServiceNow is actually going to set you up with multiple instances of the platform. You'll likely get, for example, one for development, one for testing, one for production. The important thing to remember here is that each of these instances is an entirely self-contained deployment of the platform. Oh, and each instance will also have its own URL that you'll use to connect with. As you get in there and you start working, you'll be doing things like loading data and configuring the out-of-box applications and even writing your own custom applications. And initially, you'll make all of those changes in the development instance. And then when you're ready, you'll use one of ServiceNow's deployment tools to take those changes and promote them or deploy them up to the test instance where you'll let them sit for a bit, let some users test them out and decide if they like them, which hopefully they will, and you'll decide to deploy to production instance for all to use and enjoy. ServiceNow makes it really easy and simple to deploy changes from the instance stack up the instance stack or clone back down the stack as needed. Awesome. Let me mention one more thing while we're here and we're talking about the topic of instances. ServiceNow has created this exceptionally cool opportunity for anyone interested to get set up with their very own personal instance of the platform that you can use to experiment with and learn on. This is entirely outside of your company affiliation, by the way. You can just do this yourself. All you need to do is sign up as a member of ServiceNow's developer program. There are no requirements other than a genuine interest in learning about the platform, and it's entirely free. Once you sign up, you'll have an opportunity to request your very own personal developer instance or PDI of ServiceNow. You can use that to follow along with me as, the, as we continue to learn more. And I'll put up a video walking you through that process, but it's really pretty simple. In the meantime, I'll pop the link to the ServiceNow developer site in the notes of this video. You can learn more. So when we log into ServiceNow, what we're actually logging into is a particular instance of the platform. So let's say our development instance, for example. To do that, we enter the URL of the instance in the browser and we're presented with a login screen. And this introduces the second thing that needs to be set up before you can access the platform. 
Before you can log in as a user, someone has to tell the instance who you are and what you want. We call that your persona. You see, when you log into an instance of ServiceNow, the platform has this insatiable desire to please you. It wants to make you happy by keeping you safe and presenting an experience that meets your needs as simply as possible. And in order to do that, it has to know who you are and what you're all about. And it manages this through the use of a set of tools and database tables focused around the concepts of users, groups, and roles. Follow along with me here. A user is an entity, normally a person, who has access to the platform. It's exactly what you'd think a user would be. Every user gets a user ID and password, which allows them to log in. A permission is the ability to do something on the platform. You can think of it as a key that unlocks some piece of platform functionality. And the goal is to connect each user with the permissions they need to get their work done. No more, no less. Now, it would be real straightforward to just sort of draw lines between users and permissions. Just connect them directly. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, except if I have five users and they all need the same five permissions or keys, that's a lot of lines, like 25. You can imagine the management mess we'd have with thousands of users and thousands of permissions, which is not uncommon. So ServiceNow came up with the concept of a role. A role is a set of permissions or keys that have something in common. It's kind of like a key ring with a set of permission keys on it. So in my previous example, I could take my five permissions and group them together into a role. Then I could draw a line between my five users and my one role and only have five lines. That's better. It's still a lot. So ServiceNow came up with the concept of a group. A group is a set of users that have something in common. Most likely the type of work they do, although you can group them however you like. Now I could take my five users and group them into a group. Then I could draw a line between my one group and my one role. That's one line, much better. Individual permissions pass through the roles to the groups and through the groups to the individual users. So now everyone's got what they need through a process that's flexible and easy to manage going forward. And this is a perfect opportunity to drop a little developer wisdom here. What you've just witnessed is the fact that as we add flexibility to a process, we also almost always add complexity. It's super simple, but pretty cumbersome to directly tie users to permissions. It's super flexible, but fairly complex to tie users to groups and groups to roles and roles to permissions. The best solutions usually involve a balancing act between simplicity and flexibility. That said, this is the balance upon which ServiceNow has landed for managing users, groups, and roles and permissions. Except they've decided we don't need to worry about the details of permissions at all. Permissions exist, but ServiceNow sort of hides them, giving us a base set of roles which are just group permissions to work with instead. Oh, and just to make your head hurt, roles can also contain other roles to create a sort of role hierarchies, and groups can contain other groups to create sort of group hierarchies. What? Yeah, it's all good. Just another level of flexibility and complexity. ServiceNow comes out of box with an application named User Administration. It's dedicated to managing all these users, groups, and roles. And it's all made possible by a set of database tables designed for storing these things and the relationships between them. After all, pretty much everything in ServiceNow is just a record in a database table somewhere. The user or sys underscore user table stores a record for each user. The group sys underscore user underscore group table stores a record for each group. And the role sys underscore user underscore role table stores a record for each role. Add to that a set of tables that are built to manage the relationships between these things, and you have all you need to tell the platform about each user, what they're allowed to do, or their persona. When you add a user to a group, you create an entry in the group member table, sys user gr member. When you add a role to a group, 
you create an entry in the group role table. Sys group has, sys group has role table. Finally, ServiceNow also allows you to directly add an individual user to a role by passing the use of a group. This isn't recommended. It's less flexible and it's more difficult to manage, but you can do it by creating a record in the user role or sys user has role table. Again, the user administration application provides tools for doing all of this. Don't worry too much if you don't fully understand the data model yet. We'll get there. Just know that behind the scenes, a set of database tables are working to manage users, groups, and roles, all of which build what ServiceNow calls the user persona and directs the user interface to provide the set of applications and tools needed for everyone to get their work done. That's it for now. I say in our next video, we actually log into the platform and have a look around. That'll be way more fun. Thanks for watching this one, and I'll see you in the next one.